We must accept this cruel sounding truth that slavery is of the essence of culture. In this episode of Philosophers Explained by me, Stephen Hicks, we turn to Friedrich Nietzsche's 1871, The Greek State, in which while the rest of the world is moving strongly against slavery, Nietzsche argues the opposite. Let's go to the text. The Greek state was originally written as a chapter to be included in The Birth of Tragedy. The Birth of Tragedy is uh, Nietzsche's first published work as a scholar, as an academic, as a professor at the University of Basel. But he decided to cut it because the focus of Birth of Tragedy is on the aesthetic and art, and there is a political component to that, whereas this chapter is much more overtly political and uh, the art and aesthetic element is subordinated. So Nietzsche cut it and set it aside for later uh, in order to keep the thematic focus of Birth of Tragedy on art and the aesthetic. Nonetheless, it is uh, strongly indicative of the, uh, the, the young but mature Nietzsche. This is now uh, written 1869, 1870, 1871. Birth of Tragedy was originally published in 1872. Nietzsche born in uh, 1844. So at this point, he is in his late 20s, by all accounts, a genius and a scholar of the, the first rank. So it's an uh, important uh, essay uh, in that it gives us insight into Nietzsche's uh, political thinking and his cultural thinking uh, uh, earlier in his career. So let's plunge in and uh, read a little to get a sense of uh, Nietzsche's rhetoric, his, his style, and the way he's going to frame this discussion. We moderns have an advantage over the Greeks in two ideas, which are given, as it were, as a compensation to a world behaving thoroughly slavishly and yet at the same time anxiously eschewing the word slave. We talk of the dignity of man and of the dignity of labor. All right, so pausing there. So what we have is the modern world, and we're going to be contrasting the modern world to the Greek world. And uh, uh, Nietzsche has uh, initially some disdain for the way the modern world functions. He says, we behave thoroughly slavishly. Now, what does he mean by that? Uh, uh, Even though the world is, or much of the world rather, is moving against slavery, making slavery illegal. uh, 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 Nonetheless, we are behaving slavishly. Now, we do know from some of Nietzsche's later writings that he has in mind movements like democracy and socialism and communism and various religious revivals that are going on that uh, uh, want us to fall on our knees and pray to higher beings or to worship the state or to pretend that we're all equal in some significant way and that nobody's any better than his neighbor and his mother-in-law, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this slavishness that Nietzsche sees in 19th century culture, he sees that as the essence of the modern and he's uh, disdainful of it. Nonetheless, while we are behaving slavishly, we have this uh, nice sounding rhetoric. We want to uh, give ourselves some elevation. So we talk about the dignity of man, the dignity of labor. Now, what's going on here then, picking up this first paragraph? Everybody worries in order to miserably perpetuate a miserable existence. This awful need compels man to consuming labor. So we look at what we would take to be the average worker, right, or the average person in the 19th century, uh, Nietzsche's time, as he surveys the territory. Everybody is worried about making a living. Everybody's uh, existence is miserable. Nobody is happy. And uh, we are working, working, working in order to perpetuate this miserable existence. However, <clears throat> jumping down a little, in order that labor might have a claim on titles of honor, uh, it would be necessary above all that existence itself, to which labor after all is only a painful means, should have more dignity and value than it appears to have had up to the present to serious philosophies and religions. So now we immediately elevate to the question of the meaning of life. 
Why are we working so hard? Why are we worried all of the time? Why is everybody so miserable in their day to day? Because they want to stay alive. They want to exist. So it's as a means to an end, which is to exist. But what is the point of existence? What is the meaning of living? Right, right? That's the big philosophical question. And then Nietzsche points out, he says, well, it seems like uh, existence uh, 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 doesn't really have very much value if we look at serious philosophies and religions. Now, what serious philosophies and religions would Nietzsche have in mind here? Well, maybe he's thinking about the Stoics, uh, who uh, you know, argue that uh, what we need to do is cultivate a more apathetic distance from existence and not worry about things. So that then seems to say that the life, uh, 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 an ordinary life, as Stoicism portrays it, doesn't really have much value in itself. There's no point getting caught up in it. So cultivate that distance. Maybe uh, Nietzsche is thinking about Schopenhauer, from whom he learned a great deal in the previous generation. That uh, existence is miserable and pointless and just dog eat dog until we die a pathetic existence. Maybe he's thinking about Buddhism and Christianity, both of which devalue the natural world and existence and pin their hopes on achieving a state of perhaps non-existence, selflessness, nirvana, as they will call it, or that we uh, hope that we will leave this miserable existence uh, where, the, where the wolves are devouring the sheep and go to heaven where everything is nice and God is looking after us and so forth. So all of those perhaps representative philosophies and religions are the ones Nietzsche has in mind, which don't place much stock on existence itself. So if those serious philosophies are correct, then what's the point of all of this ordinary uh, ordinary people going about their existence? They seem to cling to existence and want to exist, and they worry and they work slavishly in order to support this existence. So what's going on and what does this tell us about the modern world? Now, jumping to the next paragraph. Let me integrate here that I've added these paragraphing numbers. They're not in uh, Nietzsche's original text, uh, just in order to keep, uh, keep track of things so we can refer back and forth more easily. So, out of this awful struggle for existence, only individuals can emerge, and they are at once occupied with the noble phantoms of artistic culture lest they should arrive at practical pessimism, which nature abhors as her exact opposite. So what we have then is an opposition Nietzsche is proposing between nature and artistic culture. So nature is brutal, worrisome, apparently pointless even. And what goes on in art? Well, we have an imaginary world that is beautiful, noble, dignified. And so we have this opposition uh, set up here between art and nature. And the point seems to be that if we did not have art, then we would just be facing nature raw, so to speak. And nature raw would just make us pessimistic. So art seems to be serving some sort of psychological function in order to help us escape or get some distance from or go into some sort of world that is not the natural world. And this is an interesting phenomenon. In the modern world, which compared with the Greek usually, only, usually produces only abnormalities and Centaur, so the kind of uh, human beings that we create, you know, even if they don't look like admirals, they look like ordinary people, nonetheless, in their existence and in their psychology, they are abnormalities and centaurs in contrast to the Greeks. Here, in the modern world, in one and the same man, the greed of the struggle for existence and the need for art show themselves at the same time. Out of this unnatural amalgamation has originated the dilemma to excuse and to consecrate that first greed before this need for art. Therefore, conclusion, we believe in the dignity of man and the dignity of labor. So, hypothesis then, it is this need for art and this uh, ability to go into an artistic world, that perhaps is going to redeem 
our existence in some way. But in order to get there, first we need to be working and supporting ourselves in a way so that we can have the mental space and perhaps the material resources to do art. And that means we have to work very hard, and that means that we need in some sense to consecrate that need for working hard in the first place. And so then we start talking about dignity of human beings who are working hard, the dignity of labor and the dignity of, say, the ordinary man. All right, so that's a hypothesis. And then Nietzsche steps back and then scornfully in the next paragraph. The Greeks did not require such conceptual hallucinations. For among them, the idea that labor is a disgrace is expressed with startling frankness. Pausing. So we moderns want to pretend that ordinary human beings have dignity, that their labor has dignity. And we do this in order to justify our, 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 our meaning of our existence in some way. And the, Nietzsche is then saying the Greeks didn't mess around with any of that fakery, any of those hallucinations. Labor is a disgrace. It has no dignity to it at all. The Greeks recognize this. And another piece of wisdom, more hidden and less articulate, but everywhere alive, added that the human thing was also an ignominious and piteous nothing and the death of a shadow. So labor is a disgrace because existence has no value in itself. That's the Greek view as Nietzsche is interpreted. By contrast, we moderns want to say, believe this hallucination that existence matters and that the labor that supports our existence also has some sort of dignity. So the moderns and the Greeks are opposite. And it's quite clear that Greeks have, uh, have Nietzsche's sympathy on this point. Labor is a disgraced disgrace, indeed, a double disgrace, by the fact that it is impossible for man fighting for the continuance of bare existence to become an artist. So, Nietzsche in a later work said that a married philosopher belongs in comedy. The idea being there that the demands of married life and the demands of being a philosopher in some genuine sense, there is no way to put that together. What Nietzsche is indicating here is that we are slaves to our work lives and that makes it impossible for us to be artists. There is no way to put that together. First indication of that here. The slave who, according to his nature, must give deceptive names to all conditions in order to be able to live. Such phantoms as the dignity of man, the dignity of labor, are the needy products of slavedom hiding itself from itself. We have to get up in the morning. We have to go to work. We have to do what the boss tells us. We have to pay the mortgage. We have to do uh, what our wives or husbands or, or, or our children want us to do and so forth. We are slaves all through uh, in this case, even if we don't call it slavery in the modern world, but then we are pretending to ourselves that we are not slaves because we want to think of ourselves as having some dignity. Cursed seducers, Nietzsche goes on, who have destroyed the slave's state of innocence by the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So back in the olden days, then we might say, there was a more naive kind of slavery where the vast majority of people were slaves or led slavish life, but they didn't say no any better. And they didn't have cursed modern philosophers coming along and giving them airs and telling them that they uh, can have a better life, that they can have some dignity and uh, to give some fancy labels to what is in fact still in the modern world a slavish existence. Transparent lies such as the alleged equal rights of all or the so-called fundamental rights of man, of man as such, or the dignity of labor. So here we're talking about the entire uh, apparatus of modern and enlightenment philosophy, particularly in its liberal manifestation. All of that is a seduction, a cursed seduction, that is a set of transparent lies that have been developed in the modern world to hide from ourselves our true and still slavish existence. 
And what we are doing is denying a fundamental truth. Indeed, he is not to understand at what stage and at what dignity, or at what height rather, dignity can first be mentioned, namely at the point where the individual goes wholly beyond himself and no longer has to work and to produce in order to preserve his individual existence. A work life has no dignity. The only point at which we can first start talking about human dignity is the point at which an individual no longer has to work. There's no way to put together dignity and work. Now, what about art, though? Because we moderns have at the same time this need for art or this aspiration for art or the sense that somehow art can elevate us, and we want that, and we want somehow to combine that with our still slavish work existence. And again, Nietzsche wants to argue the Greeks were more honest than we are. Maybe we moderns think we want to become artists, and if we become artists ourselves, that we can redeem and uh, give dignity to our existence. And the Greeks want to say, not even that is going to work. In one place, Plutarch, with earlier Greek instinct, says that no nobly born youth on beholding the Zeus in Pisa would have the desire to become himself a Phidias, Phidias, the artist who made the Zeus, or on seeing the Hera at Argos to become himself a polyclite, the sculptor. And just as little would he wish to be Anacreon, the poet, Philetus or Archilochus, another poet, however much he might revel in their poetry. To the Greek, the work of the artist falls just as much under the undignified conception of labor as any ignoble craft. So the consumption of art has nobility and dignity and can take us to elevated places, but the creation of art or the production of art does not. That's still on the work side, that's still on the labor side, and that has no dignity in itself. If the compelling force of the artistic impulse operates in him, then he must produce and submit himself to the need of labor. Production of any sort is ignoble. The appreciation and the being taken by the product into certain aesthetic realms, that possibly has some dignity. And he gives an analogy to sex, he being Nietzsche here. As the father admires the beauty and the gift of his child, but thinks of the act of procreation with shame-faced dislike, so it was with the Greek. Sex itself on this account is low, shameful, and so forth, but it can give rise to beauty. But we don't admire the sex act itself, only its product, just as we will not admire the artist or the act of artistic creation or artistic production, but we might admire the artwork itself. Labor is undignified through and through, even if it is artistic labor. The same feeling veiled also the origin of the great works of art in spite of the fact that through them a higher form of existence is inaugurated. Now we have the general idea to, to which are to be subordinated the feelings which the Greeks had which re, with regard rather to labor and slavery. Both of them were cons, both were considered by them as a necessary disgrace. So labor is a disgrace, but now we're adding a word, a necessary disgrace, a necessary evil, something that has to happen in order that something good can possibly be. And we have some suggestion that art and aesthetic experience is one such good, perhaps the only good that can emerge from it. And here then Nietzsche draws his first major conclusion. Culture which is chiefly a real need for art, rests upon a terrible basis. In order that there may be a broad, deep, and fruitful soil for the development of art, the enormous majority must, in the service of a minority, be slavishly subjected to life's struggle to a greater degree than their own wants necessitate. At their cost, through the surplus of their labor, that privileged class is to be relieved from the struggle for existence in order to create and to satisfy a new world of 
want. So what we have then is a suggestion that there's a majority of people and there's a minority of people. The majority of people are going to be a means to the end of the minority of people. This minority of people, it may be that uh, lots of people could be candidates for that, but they need to be the lucky ones in some way who do not have to work so that they can develop themselves to high culture, especially to art. Or it may, of course, be that those are the ones, the small minority by nature, who have what it takes in order to be able to elevate themselves to an artistic and aesthetic lifestyle. Accordingly, harsh truth. We must accept this cruel sounding truth that slavery is of the essence of culture. Slavery is of the essence of culture. No slavery, no culture. Culture rests on necessarily a basis of much and significant slavery. Now, in historical context, this is interesting because Nietzsche is writing this perhaps in the late 1860s, early uh, 1870s. And if we look at the rest of the world or much of the rest of the world uh, in the 1860s, great movements afoot to abolish serfdom as had happened in Russia. The U.S. fighting a civil war largely over the issue of slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation had been issued freeing the slaves. Uh, many countries abolishing slavery, slavery, and especially the British uh, exerting great efforts to try to stamp out the international slave trade. And all of this of the modern world, Nietzsche is saying, no, wrong, the opposite is true. Rather than abolishing slavery, slavery is absolutely necessary carrying on. In order that there may, may be a broad, deep, and fruitful soil for the development of art, that art is the thing that is going to redeem human existence, the, the enormous majority must, in the service of a minority, be slavishly subject to life struggle and to a greater degree than their wants necessitate at their cost through the surplus of their labor or privileged classes to be relieved. Repeating this, absolutely essential paragraph. The misery of the toiling men must still increase in order to make production of the world of art possible to a small number of Olympian men. So a kind of aristocracy, not an aristocracy necessarily of the military or of a royal family, but an aristocracy of cultured individuals, cultured artists. And now assessing some of the prominent movements of the 19th century that Nietzsche has disdained for liberalism, communism, socialism. Here is to be found the source of that secret wrath nourished by communists and socialists of all times and also by their feebler descendants, the white race of the liberals, not only against the arts, but also against classical and Antiquity. So he sees in all of those movements, because their sympathies are with the ordinary working people, uh, wanting to have a broad-based belief in, say, the dignity of labor or universal rights of all human beings. This is animated really by a secret wrath because they recognize their natural enemies in the higher class, those who are genuinely cultured, and that inequality is the truth. Now, historically, uh, Nietzsche then wants to bring in, aside from the uh, communists and the socialists and the liberals, the political movements, the major religious movements of the, uh, the Western world particularly. And so here he singles out Christianity. He wants to say, even in the rise of Christianity, Christianity is also about the common man, right? The, the meek shall inherit the earth, uh, blessed are the poor, and so forth. So their sympathies are there. Woe to them that are rich. Woe to them that are powerful, and so forth. So that same uh, adversarialism toward higher types of human beings, that same rejection of, of it. But at the same time, Nietzsche says, it is not to be forgotten that the same cruelty which we found in the essence of culture lies also in the essence of every powerful religion, and in general, the essence of power which is always 
evil, carrying on a little later. That which in this sorry scheme of things will live and must live is at the bottom of its nature a reflex of the primal pain and primal contradiction and must therefore strike our eyes as an insatiable greed for existence and an eternal self-contradiction within the form of time, as, therefore as becoming. And so what we find in Christianity and most of the uh, other religions of this sort is a recognition that the world is a certain way and then a flight from it to a higher world or an alleged higher world that is, of course, imaginary, that is the opposite from the world of being to the world of becoming, from the world of change to eternal perfection, from corruption and death to living an immortal existence, from imperfection and savagery to love and uh, uh, total benevolence. Every moment devours the preceding one. Every birth is the death of innumerable beings, begetting, living, murdering. All is one. Jumping down, out of the emasculation of modern man has been born the enormous social distress of the present time, not out of the true and deep commiseration for that misery. Another fact is much more certain than that we shall say that we shall perish through the lack of slavery. The thing that makes possible the existence of a kind of Christian dedication, say the way monks and nuns and so forth will do, is at the same time uh, dependent upon the miserable existence still a vast number of individuals on whom, whose alms rather they are going to support themselves. That class of existence will go away without slavery as well. And so Nietzsche says historically an interesting point here, slavedom did not appear in any way objectionable, much less abominable, either to early Christianity or to the German race. So even there, slavery is accepted or at least not seen as particularly problematic. That's the nature of life. And Christianity is offering then simply an imaginary kind of consolation against what they recognize to be the truth of life. All right, now things get more complicated. So far, we've been talking about some religions, some political movements, but Nietzsche becomes more overtly political and articulates a conception of what he takes a proper form of politics to be and the role of the state. We need to exist, we need to work in order to support this higher class of beings who are going to uh, create and participate in an aesthetic life. But how is that going to come about? Nietzsche is going to argue that there is essentially a role for the state. It is only the iron clamp of the state that constrains the large masses upon one another in such a fashion that a chemical decomposition of society with its pyramid-like superstructure is bound to take place. So what we might earlier have is tribes and clans and family structures and everything is pretty uh, uh, low-level egalitarian. There are small hierarchies within all of these things here. But if we are really going to rise above that, we need larger scale organization, a larger scale coordination of labor, and then the ability to extract from that large amounts of surplus value to support this higher aristocratic class. This is one function of the state and perhaps the most important function of the state for Nietzsche. Whence, however, originates this sudden power of the state whose aim lies much beyond the insight and beyond the egoism of the individual. The egoism of the individual, I just want to get on with my life, with my family, right? whatever it is. Nonetheless, I am going to be absorbed into this state and be made to function for its purpose. How did the slave, the blind mole of culture, originate? The Greeks, in their instinct relating to the law of nations, have betrayed it to us. And so the Greeks, uh, Nietzsche wants to argue, makes no, no, uh, they make no bones about it. To the victor belongs the vanquished, with wife, child, life, and property. Conquest. I defeat you. Whatever you had belongs to me. Power gives the first right. 
And there is no right which at bottom is not presumption, usurpation, violence. All right, that's the Greek way, the naked uh, uh, embrace of power and violence. And uh, uh, the, the, the winners then become the state and they take what they want for their own purposes. Here again, we see what with what pitiless inflexibility nature in order to arrive at society. So here are the languages that uh, uh, nature seems to have a plan, perhaps a, a hidden plan. Those uh, of us who have read uh, 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 some Hegel might be getting some indications of Hegel and a little bit behind Hegel, this notion of a kind of providence or a hidden secret of nature that nature is evolving in a certain direction. Uh, keep an ear out for those echoes. We do have a, a Philosopher's Explained episode on Hegel's philosophy of history in which these themes are much more explicit, Hegel being perhaps the ruling philosopher of Germany in the generation previous to Nietzsche. The pitiless inflexibility nature in order to arrive at society forges for herself the cruel tool of the state namely that conqueror with the iron hand who is nothing else than the objectification of the instinct indicated the power instinct the instinct for violence con uh, con con conquer conquest subjugation and then expropriation from those one has that nature uh, herself right uh, personified in feminine form here is generating the tool of the state with its conquest in order to make society possible. The weaker forces attach to them, but then something interesting happens. The weaker forces attach themselves to them with such mysterious speed and transform themselves so wonderfully into the sudden swelling of that violent avalanche under the charm of that creative kernel into an affinity hitherto not existing, that it seems as if a magic will were emanating from them. So what Nietzsche is saying here is the strong, powerful ones come along and they conquer the weaker ones and take all of their stuff and make the weaker ones do what they want. But then interestingly, the weaker themselves accept this and start to revere and look up to and start to see themselves as tools in the service of the state as embodied by these stronger individuals, a kind of hero worship or a reverence or a subordination of self in the being of those higher beings. Now when we see how little the vanquished trouble themselves after a short time about the horrible origin of the state. So we get conquered, terrible stuff happens to us, but then within a few years we've forgotten about this and all the pomp and majesty and the gloriousness of the state. I am now worshiping it, even though that was the same state that did horrible things to me not very long ago. Hearts involuntarily go out towards the magic of the growing state with the presentiment of an invisible deep purpose. And again, invisible deep purpose. Somehow nature has this hidden or secret plan at work uh, in the creation of the state and thereby of a certain sort of society. Uh, where the calculating intellect is enabled to see an addition of forces only. So we only see surface results, but really there's something deeper going on. Now, when the state is even contemplated with fervor as the goal and the ultimate aim of the sacrifices and duties of the individual, then out of all that speaks the enormous necessity of the state, without which nature might not succeed in coming through society to her deliverance in semblance in the mirror of the genius. So nature has a plan Right. Nature then creates these terrible individuals who use their power. They forge a state that dominates over society, use all of society's resources for its purpose in order to create the genius, that rare individual who can do something special. One would feel inclined to think that a man who looks into the origin of the state will henceforth seek his salvation at an awful distance from it. So you look too closely at that political origin and you think you would run away from it as much as possible. And where one cannot see the monuments of its origin, devastated lands, destroyed cities, brutalized men, devouring hatred of nations, 
the state of ignominiously low birth for the majority of men, a continually, a continually flowing source of hardship at frequently recurring periods, the consuming torch of mankind. It's terrible. It's awful what the state does, and it does to most of us. But at a word at which we forget ourselves, a battle cry, which has filled men with enthusiasm for innumerable really heroic deeds, perhaps the highest and most venerable object for the blind and egoistic multitude, which only in the tremendous moments of state life has this strange expression of greatness on its face. The vast majority of us will say, yeah, let's go to war again, forgetting what just happened in the previous generation. Yet yeah, some general comes up wearing fancy, or the king uh, uh, holds up his mace, and we, oh, we are filled with awe, and we want to submerge ourselves and dedicate ourselves and sacrifice ourselves for this majestic. We have, however, to consider the Greeks. And the Greeks had a similar kind of phenomenon. They too were human beings. Such an unconditional immolation of all other interests in the service of the state instinct. The same thing happened to the Greeks. If we jump um, uh, two millennia later, the Renaissance in Italy, similar title and all of the war and animosities uh, that, uh, that happened that made possible then the great outpouring of Renaissance art. The same terrible things are happening among the Greeks, a wonderful outpouring of art. So overloaded is that passion. Whither does this naive barbarism of the Greek state point? What is its excuse before the tribunal of eternal justice? Proud and calm, the state stop, steps before this tribunal, and by the hand it leads the flower of blossoming wood, womanhood, Greek society. So the state is a terrible monster doing terrible deeds, but it comes before the tribunal of eternal justice, and it stands tall and proud, leading this glorious womanhood society that it has uh, both conquered and created. For this Helena, the state waged those wars. And what gray-bearded judge here could condemn? So the judges are going to say, yes, history is terrible, but out of that history, we judge it by its fruits, which are good. Under this mysterious connection, which we here divine between state and art, political greed and artistic creation, battlefield and works of art. We understand by the state, as already remarked, only the cramp iron which compels the social process, whereas without the state, in the natural Latin phrase, war of all against wall, or war of all against all, society cannot strike root at all on a larger scale and belong beyond the reach of the family. Normally, we are at war with each other, war of all against all, but at a small scale, it is chaotic. It, chaotic. it does not add up to anything. The state takes charge of this, the cramp iron, and out of that war and the own wars that it itself then initiates, it will nonetheless direct the fruits of that war to something special. I will not hide these phenomena of the president in which I believe I discern dangerous atrophies of the political sphere equally critical for art and society. So what's going on in the present where to some extent we are still warlike, we are still working hard, we have a state, we have an artistic culture and so forth, but how is it all being put together in the modern world? Is it being put together in a way that is fruitful or ultimately not? If <clears throat> there should exist men who, as it were, through birth are placed outside the national and state instincts, who consequently have to esteem the state only insofar as they conceive that it co coincides with their interest, then such men will necessarily imagine as the ultimate political aim the most undisturbed collateral existence of the great political communities possible, in which they might be permitted to pursue their own purposes without restriction. Now, 
what Nietzsche then is saying is there are some singular, unique, rare individuals who are their own men, so to speak. They're not consumed by their slavish day-to-day -day existence. They don't worry about what their neighbors think about them. They don't uh, simply uh, go along with what the state tells them out of a, st a sense of obedience following the rules. They are not those who have this strange psychological worship of the state and are therefore willing tools of it. These are some rare individuals who have their own goals, their own values, their own visions. And so they are able to step outside of the normal way of looking at life, society, and the state that is common to the vast majority of people. Those individuals will look at the state and ask, all of this great power and wealth of resources that has been accumulated in the state, how can I make it coincide with my interests? How can I use it for my interests? With this idea in their heads, they will promote the policy which will offer the greatest security to these purposes. I know what I want to accomplish. How can I make sure the state and society are such that I can do that, including using the state and society? With this idea in their heads, okay, <clears throat> uh, by contrast, all other citizens of the state are in the dark about what nature intends with her state instinct within them, and they follow blindly. Only those who stand outside this instinct know what they want from the state and what the state is to grant them. Therefore, it is almost unavoidable that such men should great, gain great influence in the state because they are allowed to consider it as a means, whereas all the others under the sway of those unconscious purposes of the state are themselves only the means for the fulfillment of the state purpose. So we have those who uh, will become society that is used by the state, and there is that small minority of people who have their own interests and goals. They will come to use the state for their own purposes. In order now to attain through the medium of the state the highest furtherance of their selfish aims, it is above all necessary that the state be wholly freed from those in awfully incalculable war convulsions so that it may be used rationally. So they want to bring an end to certain kinds of wars so that they can then devote the resources of society and the state to their own ends. Now, here Nietzsche says it becomes interesting because there's a kind of fork in the road among these men in terms of what their values are. This purpose they attain best through the most general promulgation of the liberal optimistic view of the world, which has its roots in the doctrine of, the French, of French rationalism and the French Revolution that is in a wholly undermanic, genuinely neo-Latin, shallow, and unmetaphysical philosophy. So the fork in the road here is that some of these men who are able to step outside and form their own values uh, are coming from a different cultural tradition, a non-German one, French rationalism, French, those Frenchies, and he's going to say some unpleasant things about the English as well. But nonetheless, it's very different from those special Germans who are going to be able to step outside of that framework. I cannot help seeing in the prevailing international movements of the present day and the simultaneous promulgation of universal suffrage, the effects of the fear of war above everything else. Yes, I behold behind these movements, those truly international homeless money hermits, the capitalists of the 19th century, the industrialists, the great business people of the 19th century, uh, West of the uh, west of the Rhine Europe and Western Europe, and perhaps even going as far as, as America, that un-German. They are internationalist. They are all about money, money hermits hoarding their money and so forth, pushing peace and suffrage and this view of the, that the world should be free and we can be optimistic about the future. All of that worldview, un-Germanic, that is happening. Uh, by those who want to use the state for that set of purposes, but it's not the one that Nietzsche is going to favor. 
with their natural lack of state instinct, have learned to abuse politics as a means of the exchange, the stock market, the state and society as an apparatus for their own enrichment. They're just about money, about business, about capital, about that sort of stuff. That's not a dignified purpose from Nietzsche's perspective. Nonetheless, they are powerful and they are a danger. Against the deviation of the state tendency into a money tendency to be feared from this side, the only remedy is war and, once again, war. So against those liberal, capitalist, money hoarders, French, British, Americans, the rest of the line, the only thing that we can then do is fight a war against them so that their use of the state and society does not come to dominate. Instead, it needs to be another one, and the only way to get there is going to be war. All right. In the emotions of which this at least becomes obvious that the state is not founded upon the fear of the war demon as a protective institution for egoistic institutions, that's the wrong view, but in love to fatherland and prince, it produces an ethical impulse indicative of a much higher destiny. So we cannot uh, uh, allow the philosophy that is pacifistic, liberal, capitalistic, uh, pacific and so forth, egoistic, individualistic. Instead, what we need to do is have a philosophy that loves the fatherland, loves the royalty, the prince. It produces then an ethic. That's going to be the ethical impulse, and that's going to take us possibly in a higher direction. And Nietzsche is here indicating that Germans, right, that at least German philosophy, is going to be the source of this. If, therefore, I designate as dangerous and characteristic sign of the present political situation the application of the revolutionary thought in the service of a selfish, stateless, money aristocracy, that's the wrong view. That's the dangerous one. If, at the same time, I conceive of the enormous dissemination of liberal optimism as the result of modern financial affairs fallen into strange hands, and if I imagine all evils of social conditions together with the necessary decay of the arts to have either germinated from that root or grown together with it, because of all of that terrible stuff that happened, that terrible danger, then for me, one will have to pardon my occasionally chanting a paean on war. I, Nietzsche, will celebrate war poetically, and that I'm doing so, you'll have to justify my doing so because it's going against that dangerous, liberal, capitalistic, non-German approach to society. But be it then pronounced that war is just as much a necessity for the state as the slave is for society. So if we are going to redeem existence, we need a certain kind of higher individual. For that, we need a state, we need a society. The state needs war, society needs slavery. So I, Nietzsche, celebrate war, I celebrate state, uh, slavery rather, as necessary steps to the creation of the higher individual. Here we see as the most general effect of the war tendency an immediate decomposition and division of the chaotic mass into military cases, castes, out of which arises pyramid-shaped on an exceedingly broad base of slave, the, the edifice of the martial society. The unconscious purpose of the whole movement constrains every individual under its yoke. In the highest caste, one perceives already a little more of what in this internal process is involved at the bottom, namely the creation of the military genius. So what we will then have is war. War will tear everything apart, but enable us to reconstruct society, as it happens immediately during war when we have military organization, military caste, which is arranged hierarchically with strict obedience, and those at the top form the strategy and the purpose for that war. So we end up with a pyramid shape. Once that is created, then, that can be transformed, or transferred, rather, into peace times for the then 
more elevated purposes that the higher men and Nietzsche have in mind. Again, it's an unconscious purpose that is going on, this whole movement of nature toward this end, but every individual is going to be brought under nature's purpose here. Sparta, as an example, uh, uh, Sparta uh, organized quite hierarchically uh, with the helots, the broad base of, broad base of slaves, supporting the higher military castes uh, in which everyone is serving and sacrificing for the state. Now, in contrast to all of this, we cannot avoid correcting our notions picked up from everywhere as to the dignity of man and the dignity of labor. So that entire liberal capitalist ethos, uh, and in some cases socialist ethos about the dignity of all human beings, Nietzsche then is saying, that's what we need to correct. I should like to think that the warlike man to be the means of the military genius and his labor again only a tool in the hands of that same Genius. So we mentioned Lycurgus in Sparta. We might mention Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Napoleon in the generation previous to, to Nietzsche, and then perhaps anticipating certain kinds of military leaders that will rise up in subsequent generations with this in mind as their purpose. Not to him as absolute man and non-genius, but to him as a means of the genius, whose pleasure can also be to choose his tool's destruction as a mere pawn sacrificed on the strategist's chessboard. Is due a degree of dignity, of that dignity, namely to have been deemed worthy of being a means of the genius. So when we talk about the dignity of man, it's not the dignity of man as the liberals want it, as the capitalists want it, as the socialists want it, that everybody is equally dignified and they're free perhaps to pursue their own, their own goals in life and enjoy their families, etc., etc. Instead, dignity, to the extent that one has dignity as an individual, it will be because you have been used, you have served, perhaps you have even been sacrificed by someone higher than you, the military genius. Man in himself, the absolute man, possesses neither dignity nor rights nor duties. It's not an end in himself right, or an individualistic end. Only as a wholly determined being serving unconscious purposes can man excuse his existence. Again, strong echoes here of Hegel in his philosophy of history and for a fuller work out of uh, this viewpoint, uh, I recommend our Philosopher's Explained episode on Hegel. Now, Plato, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Plato uh, enters the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the essay here toward the end, and uh, Nietzsche also wants to argue that as much as he is critical of much in Plato, he wants to say that Plato does represent a giant step in the right direction, even if Plato did not go far enough and perhaps uh, 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 had some internal contradictions that he could not himself resolve. Nonetheless, Plato's hierarchically or organized society is in the right direction, and he sees the kernel of good cultural and uh, political philosophy. Plato's perfect state is, according to these considerations, certainly something still greater than even the warm-blooded among his admirers' belief. The proper aim of the state, compared with which all other things are only tools, expedients, and factors toward realization, is here discovered with a poetic intuition and painted with firmness. So Plato has society organized hierarchically, three broad classes. This is most worked out in the Republic. People who are workers, uh, who have uh, limited rights and no participation in strategy and policy. A larger group of, uh, of, of guardians and military types who are, are keeping the internal peace and protecting the state against internal. And then a larger group of uh, philosophers who are specially selected for their intelligence and for their character, who also are servants of the state, but they set the policies and make sure that everybody is organized in order to achieve the state's purposes. 
that in his perfect state he did not place at the head of the genius in its general meaning, but only the genius of wisdom and of knowledge, and that he altogether excluded the inspired artist from his state, that was a rigid consequence of the Socratian judgment on art, which Plato, struggling against himself, had made his own. So Plato is going in the right direction of arguing for a hierarchical, dictatorial uh, uh, state and recognizing that it takes certain special individuals to be at the top of the state. But nonetheless, he has, as a student of Socrates, absorbed a narrower Socratic understanding of what the highest type of individual is, the individual in pursuit of knowledge and wisdom and so forth, not recognizing that there are other possible pursuits, and that limits his understanding of the proper purposes of this hierarchically obedient state. The mark of that is that Plato excluded the artist from the state, censorship of the artist, uh, uh, altogether uh, and harsh things said about art as an enterprise, whereas Nietzsche wants to argue that the artist is uh, the, uh, uh, the only type of genius that can possibly redeem humanity in its sorry existence. It's an almost incidental gap, Nietzsche goes on to say, and that must not prevent our recognizing in the total conception of the Platonic state the wonderfully great hieroglyph of a profound and eternally to be interpreted esoteric doctrine of the connection between the state and genius. So in Plato, we find in this final word, a cryptograph. We have to either see in Plato a kernel of the right kind of state, right, or that perhaps Plato is pulling his punches in some red sense, is writing in code, and that there's an esoteric doctrine that Plato wants us to find. Uh, and if we find that esoteric doctrine, that will be the one that Nietzsche is endorsing. War and slavery as essential and fundamental in order to create the right kind of society, a state that then mobilizes all of the resources of a society for some one or a few aims and certain special individuals who are at once outside of the state, but nonetheless able to use the state for their own selfish purposes to take human beings in a way that will redeem uh, and make possible some sense of exaltation of human existence, despite the fact that in nature itself, things are raw, bloody, and apparently meaningless.